Monsanto. 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 A Monsanto worker who left his post is being blamed for yesterday's chemical spill that forced the evacuation and medical treatment of hundreds. It happened yesterday afternoon at the Crum Rick plant in Sage, Illinois. About 300 gallons of phosphorus trichloride spilled on the ground when a railroad tank car was being filled. A cloud of acidic gas moved over homes in East St. Louis, forcing the evacuation. In the meantime, officials pledged to be better neighbors to area residents. I'm sure we can, we can coexist. Safety is uh, clearly the number one priority here at the, at the Columbus plant. This is what has concerned environmentalists. Strange-looking discharges pouring out of pipes into the Mississippi. Now, while we do permit facilities to discharge certain amounts of pollutants, we certainly want to limit the amount going into the river because the, the pollutants that are going out there um, are toxic. They can cause cancer. They can cause uh, problems with the aquatic community in the river. Earlier this month, the environmental group Greenpeace issued a report showing the death rate along the Mississippi River, and especially in St. Louis, was higher than the national average. But the EPA denied that's what prompted their investigation. And above all, Monsanto will continue to believe in the future. Nestled along the Mississippi River, there lies a small village just a few minutes east of St. Louis, known as Soje. Unknown to many, this town was originally incorporated as Monsanto in 1926, and it wasn't until years later that the name Soje was adopted. In the spring of 2009, a small group of filmmakers set out to explore the rise of industry in the small towns surrounding St. Louis in an attempt to discover the true impacts that industry has had in this part of the world. Some might find it surprising that in 1250 AD, there existed a massive Native American civilization just south of Soche. It was so big, in fact, that it rivaled many European civilizations at the time. The name of this once grand city is Cahokia, and it is host to the largest man-made mounds north of Mexico. To marvel at the beauty of Cahokia is like taking a small glimpse into the past and allows us to envision the natural setting in the Mississippi floodplains. It wasn't until the turn of the 20th century when people like John Francis Queenie showed up in the St. Louis area to stake their claim in commercial enterprise. Queenie opened the first Monsanto plant in St. Louis in 1901. And now, over a century later, it's vital that we explore the effects of big business in this part of the world. What once was a tiny company became a giant which makes over a billion dollars in profit each year. Monsanto is actually one of the last industrial suburbs that's created. It's created about the year 1926, 1927, and it is, it is incorporated by the company for the company. And it is run, it is run uh, with, with a, a panel of people who are friendly to industry. And it, it issued promotional brochures that said exactly that. We are governed by men who are friendly to, to industrial interests and that there are no nuisance taxes here and the tax rates are kept low. 
And it, it clearly is just so obvious that Monsanto was a company that was making some very nasty chemicals. It started out with its caustic acid plant in, in Soje, in what is now Soje. And it was making some nasty chemicals, and it wanted, uh, it wanted to control land use and nuisance laws and tax rates, not only for its own plant, but for the people who would use their products. And so they encouraged other companies to locate in the city of Monsanto. And Monsanto was not alone. The National Stockyards incorporated as National City. They incorporated in 1907, long before Monsanto showed up. The Roxana Petroleum Company, a division of Shell Oil, created Roxana, Illinois. Wood River, Illinois is taken over by Standard Oil that opens up a refinery right next door to, to Roxana. So we have this very substantial growth of industrial suburbs. Um, going back really to, to the incorporation of Granite City, which was opened uh, by the Niedringhaus Steel Company, manufacturers of granite ware. So they called it Granite City after their number one product. They opened up in the 1890s. All of these companies went in and they created cities that served industrial interests first, and people came second. There is a heavily polluted creek that runs through the Soje area. It is appropriately named Dead Creek. For years, toxic waste from the Crumrich plant in Soje was emptied into the waters of Dead Creek, which eventually runs off into the Mississippi. Well, yeah, originally we were told uh, Monsanto Solution was gonna clean all the toxic waste out of it. And they were gonna, they said beautify it, put rock and uh, like you did on the other side. And uh, for some reason, they refused to tell us why they quit on our side. The water doesn't drain anymore. And that side, water still drains to this side. And they did beautify it. I mean, they put the rock down and uh, landscaped it. But we didn't get anything. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman and chief executive officer of Monsanto, Mr. Richard J. Mahoney. Hello. I thought it fitting to begin in this advanced technology setting. For as we project that molecular image using the latest in video technology, the sign on our video wall clearly points to the new Monsanto, to its roots in chemistry, to its important roles in agriculture, process controls, biotechnology, and pharmaceuticals. When Teddy Roosevelt was in the White House, certain big business leaders were afraid he would break up the monopolies. United States Steel was founded in 1901 when J.P. Morgan bought out Andrew Carnegie, allowing Morgan to control 65% of America's steelmaking capacity. At the same time, the Sugar Trust held nearly a complete monopoly. In Germany, the Folberg Company had a monopoly on the artificial sweetener saccharin until John Francis Queenie began Monsanto Chemical Works in St. Louis in 1901, naming it after his wife Olga Monsanto. No one else in America was manufacturing saccharin at the time, and Queenie saw an opportunity that couldn't be missed. The original Queenie plant manufactured saccharin, caffeine, and vanillin, which it sold to the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta. Monsanto headquarters are in St. Louis. And within the U.S., 34 states are home to Monsanto facilities. Monsanto also holds locations around the world in 61 countries.
At one point, Monsanto Chemical Company was responsible for producing a wide array of material plastics, polymers, resins, hydraulic fluids, aspirin, acids, petroleum additives, and flavoring. Monsanto has received negative publicity for certain products like DDT, Agent Orange, a dioxin-riddled chemical known to be carcinogenic, which was used as a deforestation agent in the Vietnam War. Bovine growth hormones, also known as BGH, which have heightened the bacteria colonies in American milk, and as a result have been banned in Europe and Canada. Monsanto is responsible for 56 contaminated areas around the world known as Superfund sites. A Superfund site is an abandoned toxic waste area near people and communities. The Superfund law was created to help protect citizens from neglected toxic dumping grounds. Soge hosts two Superfund sites directly attributed to Monsanto. There's two proposed uh, national priority list sites, so two Superfund sites in our cleanup program in the Soge area. And, um, we call them Sage Area 1 and Area 2. Sage Area 1 is the part in blue here, and it's made up of about three miles of a creek that's dead creek that runs down here and then hooks into another creek um, and then into, flows into the Mississippi River. Around that um, creek, there's oh, four or five um, closed landfills and a um, an old uh, lagoon area that um, were source areas to the creek, and those are also part of the Superfund site. Um, the plant facility here, that um, the Crumrich plant that um, is owned by Solution today, um, was one of those source areas uh, to the creek, um, but one of many others too. Most of the Superfund site, both one and two, are in the town of Sage. East St. Louis. Uh, boundary is around here. Um, most of this is the town of Sage. The town of Cahokia is um, around in here. The Dead Creek issue in, in the East St. Louis area is a very serious one. There's a lot of very nasty pollutants in that stream. Um, I think we need to remember that it's it's not like the it's not like the pollution is only falling on the creek. It's falling on the entire area for which that creek is the watershed. So, the the land around it is polluted when there's rain and that soil drains out. And we're in a floodplain, so there's a lot of water moving through. It it carries all those pollutants into the creek as well as maybe direct illegal dumping into the creek over time. The uh, the, the, the creek poses a significant problem. The guy that used to be a consultant for Solution, he, he used to come around, come around and we talked to him and he, what he thought he was going to get done for us. And I guess he finally aggravated him. They fired him and we got nobody to you know, confer with. And, they, and you try to call Solution and get an answer, or the EPA give it, won't give you an answer. chemistry, creative solutions, solution. Monsanto's modern chemical division is known as Solutia. Solutia's facilities are located on Monsanto Avenue, a major public road in Sochi. The director of this project made many attempts to try and film inside the Crumrich plant. 
However, after being passed along between various employees within the company, the request was denied. The Crumridge plant is a Homeland Security protected facility and filming inside is strictly forbidden. Within five minutes of taking footage in this public area, the filmmakers were confronted by the Soje police. Immediately, they were coerced into surrendering their identifications. They were also informed that doing so would result in their names being placed on an FBI domestic terrorist watch list. Today, over a million people have been added to this list. We're not shooting anything. We're not shooting anything though. This isn't this isn't no them, videotaping though. up here. I'll go ahead and sign a complaint. I have no, a I'm, complaint. I'm sorry. right to jail. We've but... talked about this before. We must question what exactly is so important within the Crumridge plant that they would be so concerned with filming outside their facility. We must ask what there is to hide. We must look to the past for answers. My argument is that we need to pay special attention because industrial suburbs got there by a different path and therefore have different solutions required. They took this path of, of creating governments that were designed for industry. They were purely designed to take care of industry. They were not designed to take care of people. And we need to think back about what local government did a hundred or more years ago. There was no national income tax at the turn of the last century. There, was, uh, there, there really was no state income tax that really what we saw, taxes were local and, and these businesses were operating, uh, they, they really cared about property taxes because that would be very, uh, could be very substantial for these industries. They cared about land use and that was something that local governments controlled. And they, they, they were concerned about nuisance laws. And nuisance laws basically are any kind, if, if anything that would be determined a nuisance, if, it, if a nuisance was determined to be coming from a factory, it could be noise, it could be stench, it could be pollution. Whatever was bothersome, whatever was causing a nuisance, the city could go in and abate that. That is a very strong use of the police power. and and. Companies therefore found it advantageous to create their own cities so that they can control land use, nuisance laws, and tax rates. By doing that, companies could make more profit. And so cities like East St. Louis were very industrially friendly and, and didn't care about land use and nuisance and taxes. And all these communities that sprung up around East St. Louis are the same way, including the city of Monsanto. This is news for St. Louis Nightside. East St. Louis officer, or rather East St. Louis mayor, car officer, says he wants the residents who live near Monsanto Salje plant to move. The mayor made that remark at a community meeting of concerned residents and leaders. The Rush City neighborhood is located near Monsanto and other industries. Mayor officer wants those businesses to buy out the residents, and then the city will convert the area into an industrial park. The mayor says the city's interest for the buyout are selfish. I want my son to think about, man, I want him to pay taxes every day. I want him to pay taxes every day to the city of East St. Louis. I want him to build this area and pay taxes to us so you and your children and your grandchildren can benefit from it. Now, at this time, Monsanto has told News Ford has no direct comment on that presentation, but admits it has been studying a similar project. For almost two centuries, taking out the trash in St. Louis has meant dumping it in the river, dropping it in a sinkhole, or burning it. The cholera epidemic of 1849 prompted construction of a sewer system, but untreated sewage flowed directly into the Mississippi through the 1960s, and refuse was either dumped or burned well into the 70s. Metro St. Louis produces enough trash daily to fill a 25-foot square trash bin the height of the Gateway Arch. We use enough water every day to fill Bush Stadium. Until now, legislation and technology have kept us from being buried beneath our waste. But solid waste is still a problem. 
with limited landfill space left. We need new solutions. One of these new solutions was the creation of a massive landfill just along the border of the Cahokia Mounds State Historic Site. These mounds are located minutes away from Seleucia facilities. These mounds serve as a small testament to the beauty and richness of this land hundreds of years ago. Basically, uh, you, you have a typical uh, riverine wildlife uh, in, a, in the floodplain or wetland area, you know, in, the, in all the streams and everything, there's a lot of fish, there's a lot of waterfowl. Probably one of the reasons that Cahokia became so big and important because of its location here also near where the confluence of the Mississippi and the Missouri and the Illinois rivers, which were transportation routes. But locally, the resources provided by this uh, wetland environment was important. Uh, the, s the soils are very fertile for agriculture, which they engaged in. And uh, a whole variety of uh, plants and animals were utilized by them for food and parts of the animals also for tools and things too. The bones, uh, especially of the deer, because of their strength, were often used to make tools and uh, occasionally some, even some weapons out of it. So they, the area was uh, abundant initially, but when you have a site this big, and it grew almost six square miles in size, about 120 mounds, and people have estimated its population could be anywhere from 10 to 20,000 at its peak, around, say, 1100 AD. And not only was Cahokia here, but there are a number of surrounding communities that provided all kinds of uh, uh, probably tribute to help support Cahokia, but also they're making a demand on the environment. So you could double the population that was here for all these surrounding communities. So all these people are depleting the resources eventually. They probably, it's probably one of the reasons Cahokia was abandoned because they had run out of uh, some you know, wood. They probably cut down most of the trees for firewood, for construction. Uh, you're cutting down habitat of animals that you hunt for food. And, uh, as well when you do that. So there, as resources became more scarce, there was more competition and, and conflict and warfare through time. So a lot of political and economic changes going on uh, over you know, several hundred years of time. And eventually Cahokia probably kind of collapsed under its own weight. At this very moment, the decaying factors of our once booming industrial society are truly beginning to surface. The pressure is ascending to a critical point. If we don't change our means of industry soon, we too as a society might be crushed under our own weight. As we rapidly continue to deplete our resources and compete with one another to keep our machines fueled and running, we can see the effects it has on communities like Soje, East St. Louis, and Cahokia. The men who once dreamed big about building towards the future and making our lives better never took the time to consider the costs of these efforts. Today we can witness the collapse of towns built around industry all across the United States. If we do not achieve some sort of sustainability soon, then we too will be written into history as a society that went beyond their means only to destroy themselves.
I used to plant a big garden back there, but they found the toxins in it. I used to use well water because I had a well in the basement. I don't use it no more either. I used to drain storm water and well, deep well water because the plants at one time cooled their machinery with well water. And it all ran through Cahokia, and there's a big dump up there. And they, that's where toxic waste started. Because they dumped all that tons and tons and tons and barrels and barrels of that, that toxic stuff. Of course, we didn't know it was toxic. Me and my friends used to go up there and play in the dump, which we shouldn't have did, but then we get a wooden pallet and you just, just ride the whole length of the through town. It's important that we identify any remaining threats to the children and adults in these communities. It remains uncertain how large of a hazard these remaining toxins are to people and wildlife in these surrounding areas. People try to argue that their chemical isn't as toxic as this other one, but we, we you know, will normally let the companies work it out amongst themselves. And though usually, my experience has been that it's been a very successful program. They usually work out what, what they think and then we're made whole on our costs. To do our cleanup work, we don't actually have to demonstrate that someone got cancer from this. All we have to do is show that it's from these chemicals, if someone, got ex if someone was to drink the water and that was a real pathway of concern, that we can calculate is there, is there a risk to that person and then we can take our action. We don't ha actually have to like, if you saw the movie or read the book of civil action for that case where they were in that movie, that was before Superfund and they were trying to make a showing that these people had these effects from that site. We don't have to do that under our law actually. We just have to show that there is a potential. So we don't have to link actual cases to the site. Well, we can't prove it, but two ladies down the street died of cancer. And my wife had uh, cancer 10 years ago, but I, we've got no way to prove it. Certain threats to human health, such as increased rates in cancer, lead poisoning, and asthma, can be linked to the negligence of companies like Monsanto and Solutia. In order to protect American citizens from big polluters, the Environmental Protection Agency was established under the Nixon regime in 1970. However, throughout the agency's history, a large number of its employees have left the EPA only to turn around and go to work for the same polluting enterprises they worked so hard to fight against. This is sometimes referred to as EPA's revolving door policy. This is only a brief list of some of the men and women who have left the EPA in order to work for hazardous waste generating facilities. These companies hope to find loopholes in the system which could exempt them from any responsibilities surrounding the toxification of our watersheds, soil and air. Years ago, major polluting companies like Monsanto set up a strategy of establishing a network of influence within various government administrations, such as the EPA. Some of these men and women have gone back and forth between working for companies like Monsanto and returning right back to the EPA. Some have held simultaneous positions between the EPA and heavily polluting chemical companies. One name that stands out is Linda Fisher. Ms. Fisher is currently an executive for DuPont, another major chemical company. She serves as the DuPont Safety, Health and Environment Chief Sustainability Officer. Prior to joining DuPont, Ms. Fisher has served in a number of key leadership positions in government and industry, including Deputy Administrator of EPA, EPA Assistant Administrator, Office of Prevention, Pesticides and Toxic Substances. EPA Assistant Administrator, Office of Policy, Planning and Evaluation, and Chief of Staff to the EPA Administrator. Fisher, an attorney, was also Vice President of Government Affairs for Monsanto and was of counsel with the law firm Lathan and Watkins.
Another high-level EPA worker who is swung between government positions and working for those who pollute is William Doyle Ruckelshaus. William Doyle Ruckelshaus served as the first EPA agency administrator from December 1970 to April 1973. He left EPA in 1973 to serve as acting FBI director during the Nixon administration's cabinet openings following the breaking of the Watergate scandal, then served briefly as deputy attorney general at the Justice Department. Ruckelshaus also served on the boards of directors of Cummins Engine Company, Nordstrom Incorporated, Weyerhaeuser Company Incorporated, Gargoyles Incorporated, Coinstar Incorporated, Monsanto Company, and Solutia Incorporated. According to an article published by the Initiative for Global Development, after his second stint at the agency, he formed a consulting firm called William D. Ruckelshaus Associates, which was then hired by the Coalition on Superfund, an organization seeking to weaken the Superfund law by absolving polluters of strict legal liability for their actions. The coalition included such Superfund polluters and their insurers as Monsanto, Occidental Petroleum, Alcoa, Flow Chemical, AT&T, DuPont, Union Carbide, Aetna Insurance, and Travelers Insurance. Assisting Ruckelshaus were Lee Thomas, his hand-picked successor as EPA Administrator, and William Riley, then head of the Conservation Foundation. Ruckelshaus and Thomas helped fund Riley's organization to produce studies in support of the coalition's position. Ruckelshaus has been rewarded over the years as a key leader who helped bring about the ban of DDT in 1973. However, it's seldom recognized that it was Ruckelshaus himself who opposed the immediate ban of DDT in 1971. Scientists began expressing their concerns about DDT as early as the 1940s. However, it wasn't until Rachel Carson published her best-selling book entitled Silent Spring in 1962 that the public truly began to cry out against the harmful effects that pesticides such as DDT have on human life and wildlife. Monsanto has been responsible for the creation and distribution of a number of pesticides that continue to course their way into our food supply, even to this day. One of Monsanto's best-selling products is Roundup Weed Killer, which contains certain inert ingredients which have been linked to the destruction of human cells, particularly embryonic placental and umbilical cord cells. The solvents, preservatives, surfactants, and other substances that manufacturers add to pesticides are known as inerts. Nearly 4,000 inert ingredients are approved for use by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Today, Monsanto is an agricultural biotechnology company that specializes in genetically modifying seeds in an attempt to modify and control food supplies around the globe. Monsanto will be confronting some old problems with new biomedical research, including recombinant DNA work. This could lead to new medicines to stimulate the body's own natural defenses against disease. Certain forms of cancer, for instance. Monsanto research and production capabilities will also be devoted to the necessity for enhanced food production and better nutrition. New agricultural chemicals designed to enhance you even new, more productive plant varieties created through the marriage of Monsanto's skills in biology and chemistry are under development by the Monsanto Agricultural Products Company, which continues to expand its research presence in Belgium, Brazil, Japan, and the United States. There is a lot of pollution in the Metro East. Anywhere that there was not just industry, not just smokestacks, but the industry that was in, in Metro East was heavy industry. It was uh, refining aluminum ore, refining bauxite, uh, refining oil, uh, zinc factories were there. There were lots of heavy, heavy industry in East St. Louis, and all of them had smokestacks, and all of them spewed out toxins. For so many years, there were, there were chemical plants, or there are chemical plants there, and, and who knows what 
came out of those smokestacks for generations, for nearly, for nearly 50, 60 years. These factories were working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, spewing this smoke out over this community. The, the soil is incredibly toxic in places in East St. Louis. Lead poisoning is a very serious concern for the children in East St. Louis to this day. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency has come in, has, has ordered some large-scale cleanups, but it really is just the tip of the iceberg. I think that there, there are some very serious problems in East St. Louis, and I think it will take years to fully understand the, the environmental impact that 75 years of industrialization has caused in that town. To know the Monsanto of today, we must understand the Monsanto of yesterday. From our beginnings in 1901 to the first developments in polymers in the 30s, right into the 60s, chemicals had a business magic all its own. The mere mention of the word symbolized the wave of society's future. And from being part of it, Monsanto prospered. As science progressed, we progressed. And sometimes, as Monsanto took steps forward, so did science. Demand for our products grew despite world war, economic downturn, and the beginnings of environmental activism. During 1971, programs were well underway at the Queenie plant to correct the odor problems. These are only some of the ways that Monsanto is working around the world to achieve its goal of a clean environment. I think people driving through Soje today will, will very easily uh, recognize the Soje mansion. It is, it is the most opulent home in the entire city, and, and I think it is a, a testimony to how strongly the family feels about its town, and that they could have built that very nice estate in some very exclusive suburbs around the metropolitan area in St. Louis, but they chose to build it right there, not far from the industry in their town. And so they, uh, they, they live right there. They live right there among the factories, right there among the workers. And it's, it's a rather impressive statement at a level. It is now that the true legacy of this seemingly unstoppable industrial giant can be defined. The city of Monsanto was originally established with the hopes of serving people around the world and making their lives better. However, we can now begin to notice the effects of Queenie's vision, and we must decide for ourselves whether or not we can sit back and let these companies continue to decide for us how our lives can be improved.
I drive through Soje, I, I just, uh, I look around and I just sort of think, wow, you know, what's there that I can't see? That, you know, that looks like a field, but, but you know, <laughs> three feet deep, it's probably just toxic. And so there's just, uh, there's just, there, there's just generations of pollution. Um, I'm not surprised that the watershed is, is, is toxic. It, it, just, uh, it just isn't surprising. We could shut down every smokestack in Metro East and we would still have years worth of troubles left. Our vision in Superfund is that we'll, when we're done here, we'll leave an area that is safe for the workers that, that uh, work in each area and um, safe for construction workers that might come in in the future. Um, safe for trespassers, you know, we need to think about kids that don't always play where they're supposed to, um, and for the wildlife that lives there. Um, you know, a lot of this are, a lot of this area is active um, industrial areas, but there are some important um, wildlife zones too, especially when you get down here to the southern part of the site. Um, uh, you know, it's mostly agricultural and natural areas that even though um, you know it's not the it's not the most gorgeous natural area you find but um, it's still important it's up to us to recognize these issues discuss them and organize sustainable new solutions for our future generations we must make it our goal to try and rethink our forms of industry What was originally established to make our lives better is negatively affecting the lives of people in small towns all across the United States. Areas like Soje, East St. Louis, and Cahokia are prime examples of towns that people have chosen to cast aside and ignore. For years, the citizens of these communities have had no help or recognition. It's time now, more than ever, that we all start working together to ensure that our backyards will be safe for all of the Earth's future inhabitants. <laughs>